What's up? What's up? What's up? Welcome back, everybody, to the show. It does have a name now. Sorry to let you guys down, but we had to get 1% more professional. So welcome back to the Bitcoin Weekly Kickback with the same people, four dudes chatting about Bitcoin things. And uh, yeah, so a lot happened in the past seven to ten-ish days. Lots of good. The having ruins, epic sat, miners getting paid, uh, but bad stuff too. The U.S. is going after aggressively privacy tools, and it's already causing other providers of, say, Latin non-custodial tools to jump out of the U.S. to proactively not be targeted. So, ton to talk about. Um, but first, one thing that we talked about previously is, is there going to be a crazy hyped having block? Are the miners going to do things that... Like a, a three depth three org line of standing is like incredibly rare. It never happens. And some people out there were like, there's going to be a five block reorg. They're quite like crazy because there's so much value locked. And that didn't happen at all. They didn't, they just sat on their hands and whoever won the block won the block. Um, I don't know. What, what, do we have bets on that? I can't remember who, who saw what. We yes. had predictions. Yes, we had bets. We had bets. I, I know I lost. Bob won. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Everybody thought it was going to be crazy. In fact, it was like a hyped narrative going in, like, "Oh, the reorg. Who's going to try to get the first block?" Uh, and yeah, my my prediction was no, no reorgs because it just, I gonna it it just made sense. Yeah, I think one of the things, and I'd I'd been talking about this a lot, where I you know limited the scope of, of analysis of prediction predicting the reorg. To what if it were just the first block or two after the halving that were the big valuable block? But what we saw was that the entire like next hundred to two hundred blocks were yep. all unbelievably valuable. So it actually, you know, in retrospect, perhaps didn't make as much you know sense to try to reorg just one block, which is a thirty-seven fee Bitcoin block, and maybe rather be like, okay, well we're just gonna pocket the extra 20 bitcoin fee per block for the next like 10 20 30 blocks so yep. yeah obviously you know obviously can't analyze everything in a vacuum but bob wins this one no reorg we get some animation you know bob one and everyone else zero for the yeah. for the next yeah. well we'll uh i'll photoshop in you Winning a, a Taproot Wizard, which is like you definitely won't win that, but you can you can feel like it for that ten second block yeah. of that video clip. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, so that was that was crazy, and, and to see all the hype, and then it came and went, and then it was funny like watching the mempool dot space fee. It started at zero or like whatever it was forty or whatever. I remember seeing tweets of like some of the maps, and like this is all you DJs got. Like this is stupid. You guys are not doing what you should give it and a couple minutes like, just yeah just wait five minutes and then it just goes to <laughs> hundreds and then they add zero and then i think the height was something like two thousand that's for me by i was over like median 21 yeah yeah and that's let's talk about the rune type because like super hyped launch obviously we're coming down now i don't know i have nowhere to, where to take this like i think we may have gone through an entire technology adoption cycle peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, and then plateau mm. productivity in like a week. This was like rapid cycle technology adoption where everybody has been hyped about runes for months. You know, we've been sitting sky high, uh, pre-runes projects at, at sky high valuations. And then when runes hit and everyone saw the trading experience and it was clunky and, you know, people lost half a Bitcoin to a Cenotaph on Unisat. And, you know, all of, all of those things happened and now it's immediately trough of disillusionment like uh runes is terrible the experience is bad this isn't the solana meme coin uh casino that we were promised um and lots of people actually you know complaining about runes and then you have to acknowledge the fact that we have wallets that support runes already we have marketplaces that support runes already we have minting tools that support runes already we have multiple tokens listed on centralized exchanges I mean, we're like already on the plateau of productivity where now we have a good baseline for what Rins is. And I don't know. That's 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 my take. Yeah, I think it's it's, it's interesting too that uh, 
You know, like if you look at, I wasn't around during the ICO days on Ethereum in 2017 where like everyone was raising off of an idea and like a, a, a one paragraph blurb and that's all it took for me to waste millions. It feels like, so obviously since then I sort of gotten more, people have wised up to them. They're, they're less susceptible to bullshit. And I feel like the meme coins thing, which I haven't been a part of on other chains, is kind of happening here too. I was like, the half-life of a meme coin, meme coin narrative is just getting shorter and shorter. Like there's a smaller and smaller window to capture the value. And Ruin seems like it's that. Like it was hyped and then it's closed down. And now we're kind of like, do, do does dog have utility? Or does somebody build Ruin utility tokens? Just the pure narrative thing is like, yeah, you either have a tiny window or you're going to just be like ex liquidity and holding the bag. I don't know. I mean, uh, the runes was either a success or a failure or anything in between, depending on what side of the block you were sitting on. I mean, if you were a miner, your 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 average rev your revenue went up for a couple of days. That's the first time we ever had we saw an upwards difficulty adjustment. I believe that was the first upwards yep. difficulty adjustment post living yeah. ever. Like that's newsworthy. Now we're back down to all time low profitability for miners. You know, I I will say like we I think we all share this view here that the the particular personality to how runes and fungible tokens will play out on bitcoin is a cyclical one where you have pulses of competitive blo- of bidding against each other which drive these kind of fee revenue spike events now i was really surprised that it was this compressed like i did not expect to a week later already be like back down to normal normal fee rates but here we are I will say that I'm actually, I think Runes was a success in the, at least um, from the consideration that like nothing critical broke. Yes, Unisat had a whole Cenotaph like production issue and was like caught, you know, creating bad signatures. But like, if that was it, wow. I mean, this is now a billion dollar ecosystem almost overnight without any major critical flaws to just how it works. Remember how ordinals worked. Remember how it, it took us six months to even address the numbering issue. And then basically, you know, nine to 10 months to actually full circle do the Jubilee and have a consensus around like, what do inscriptions even look like? So here we are a week later, doesn't look, look, look like we have any critical bugs, which I think that was the thing I was looking at the, the closest. Like, are there critical bugs? across the entire ecosystem. Yep. Apparently, it does not appear that there currently are. Is there any argument that Runes was a failure? There is amongst people who expected it to be Solana immediately and for everything to be as fun so full. False, false yeah. expectations was well, that's, the only failure. Like, almost every failure of anything that's perceived that was, like, it's such a subjective term. Like, failure requires a, a perspective. And I think yeah. most of the time when people are upset in the blockchain realm, it's because they thought something that couldn't be true. And I mm-hmm. think in this case, there's no possible launch that would have made the people who are upset by it happy. I don't think anything would have done that. So I don't think it's the fault of runes. I think runes have proven to be in some way superior or helpful or you know that, that they have a seat at the table. And anybody who thinks that it's not so long, like there's no Jupiter decks. There's not any way to do that at the moment. Like you, it can't be what it is. And if you rather, it can't be that. And if you want it to be that, go do the other thing for a while and wait for that to be built here. But zero things are established on day one. They can't, it takes time to do that. Like even the BRC protocol, it took six months for anything to get a billion dollar market cap. We already have tokens that are B now, like today, five days after the launch. So like, what did we think was going to happen that would have been more successful than what already did, right? Yep. What could, yeah. what could have happened? I can empathize I, with the DGENs who, who wanted everything to go a thousand X overnight. I get that. Um, but, like, there is going to be another wave. The, like, now that the, the tooling is in place, people have to totally forsaken the ecosystem. There's going to be more. It's just, I, you know, I don't really know how it'll play out. I mean, the one the one claim I've seen that seems the most credible is that the trading experience out the gate is much closer to BRC20 than the opposite. Like, yes, you can chunk down the visibility, 
but we're still trading in batches. Even though you have to do this inscribed transfer thing, um, the UTXO bloat of like the incentive to hold more UTXOs to chunk down your dog, for example. I think that one we'll see if we'll see how far developers can push that against the protocol's limitations and op return, but that's the current one that like holds water for me. Yeah, and I've talked a lot about this about my own interest in runes, which really isn't because they're not the fungible token on Bitcoin, but but rather because they are UTXO based, it makes them very extensible onto layer twos or you know, sending them to be settled and traded elsewhere with less friction. I think that's very compelling because runes on the L1 are just not really, they're, they're always going to have like a structural issue to trade um, back and forth. They're always, it's going to be really hard to not have the BRC20 experience. Um, I mean, what's the mean? Uh, well, you know, it's just, but, but I, you know, I also have to say like, does, doesn't even matter because we've seen the market does not particularly care whether it's, you know, a UTXO based protocol or whether it's some kind of like multi sig bridge to a Merlin chain. The market doesn't really care. The market just wants to trade. So I don't know. I, you know, I I have a personal technical preference, but I don't know if I, I I don't know if I can predict anything. I just wanted to point out that I think the benefits, whether people acknowledge it or not or use it more because of these things or not. There are no transfer inscriptions and there are no, well, there are no inscriptions that are just littering everything. And when you want to break things down into new, smaller UTXOs in order to sell them as such, you just send them. You don't have to make an inscription to do so. And then when you list it and delist it, you don't have to reinscribe to list it again. There's like, there are so many individual steps taken out. It's not a single step or a single click yet. And that's what is upsetting people is that it's just not an analogous trading uh, experience. But it's way more smooth and streamlined than BRC. So you don't have all this BRC trash like the UTXO um, bloat or whatever the inscriptions laying all over the place. And the transaction size is, am I wrong about this? Is it not half the size roughly per, let's say, um, mint? That not 131 V VB roughly for a uh, runes mint and about 262 for a BRC mint? Can, it not, can Bitcoin not chew through half or twice as many transactions per block? All the transactions have like that. for sure. Yeah, Smaller like like size. significantly by fifty percent. It's, uh, it's it's a little tricky because runes one transaction equals one mint, so you have all the transaction overhead associated with it. Um, so even though you have a small op return, it has to be a full transaction. With BRC twenty, you can have the transaction overhead plus you can batch mint thousand, two thousand, five thousand in the same transaction. And so with runes, you get the overhead for every single mint. For BRC20, you just get the, you know, whatever it is, the small JSON BRC20 blob as as your um, byte size. And so I haven't actually done the comparison yet. Like, if you were going to mint a 1,000 tokens, is it better to do one transaction with a 1,000 BRC20 mints, or is it better to do a 1,000 transactions with a 1,000 runes mints? And that's yeah, the comparison... That's the comparison you need to make, and I actually don't know which one is better. I'm guessing BRC20 might actually be better in that scenario, um, just because of the transaction overhead. But then trading post-mint is lower transaction size because it doesn't require inscriptions, potentially, for runes rather. The huge, the huge unlock is you don't have to inscribe a transfer, so right. definitely fewer transactions to go to trading. And then Deal. in terms of... Runes is nicer because you can chain 25 together. This is what like the Rune Blaster does from uh Lifo um, LIFO FIFO. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it LIFO or is it LIFO? Is it LIFO FIFO? I'll ask him. I don't know. I say LIFO because that's what that's what you say it's that's how people pronounce last and first out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He <laughs> yeah. comes along. I think PC intentionally mispronounced people's name. So. Okay. Okay, so LIFO, yeah, LIFO FIFO, the the Rune Blaster. Uh, with CPFP, you can do 25 recursion depths. So that means you can take one big chunk and you can do uh, runes and then you can use the change and do another runes and use the change and do another rune 25 times. And you can basically use the same runes UTXO and conglomerate or add all of those together across the 25. Um, but with BRC20, obviously you can't. You can't. 
do that. Sure. Um, but the mint does just go to your balance, and so BRC twenty by default would be aggregating up to your to your account. Um, they're not separate. You know, when you mint, it just goes goes to your account. The, the mint inscription is worthless, and so in a way, BRC twenty is the same, where it just takes one transfer to do your whole balance as long as it's all minted to the same account. So I don't actually know if runes is lighter on Bitcoin yet. Fun to watch that play out. I was just digging through individual yeah, transactions the other day and seeing that jump in general yeah. runes transactions were smaller, but I don't think that's a holistic view of it. That's just piece by piece. Yeah. I, I think there, and some of this is limited by Casey's definition of the runes protocol. You could probably expand that if you had more opportune space yep. to yep. to further allow more expressivity in the in a multiple output transaction, but that's currently yep. not that's currently not uh, recognized in his uh, runes protocol implementation. So, oh, I just wanted to bring up um, Eloc posted something about using the inscription endpoint to uh, make inscriptions aware of the rune balance. Which is really exciting. It's an exciting idea to be able to put to send runes to a UTXO already containing an inscription, and have the inscription somehow self-update based on what type of token or the number of them. This is going to be a fun thing to see what people do with it. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, lot, so Casey originally proposed this idea a few Ordinals Coding Clubs back. Said you can do this. And now it's a matter of how you implement it. LIFO FIFO, aforementioned LIFO FIFO, threw up a PR a couple weeks ago saying, here's an idea, here's an idea we could do, we could reference root ID. And then ELOC threw up a PR saying, here's another idea, we could reference the output that the inscription is on, because we already know that. Um, so just getting this conversation going, I think this is one of those things where everybody wants it to happen. Now it's a question of how are we, how are we going to implement it? And this could potentially be one of the biggest unlocks for runes is it's natively integrated into the ordinals protocol. And you could start doing not just like airdropping, um, like easily airdropping runes to ordinal inscriptions, but also uh, supercharging inscriptions based on runes balance. So if you hold your ordinal in an account that has a runes balance of X token over a thousand or whatever, you get a better looking ordinal or something like that. Uh, you just need some kind of, yeah, yeah. You just need some kind of runes endpoint, um, and it's like a recursive endpoint, and now you can supercharge ordinals with runes. So, yeah, definitely crazy, exciting things happening with the interplay between the two. Yeah, and, and the cool thing here too, from what I understand, is that because you have two independent indexers, you couldn't do BRC twenty because it was like one. It has a dependency on ORD. When runes is separate, so you, they'll both be running independently, and you can start to play with those levers um, without. If Owen breaks, runes is still doing the fine kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, one other thing on the runes and the L two is because you brought that up for a second, Charlie. I'm like mega hyper turbo bullish on runes as um, I'm calling an interoperability token. I don't know what the fuck that means, but it, it captures it of like. If you look at crypto, everything trades against USDT for the most part. And we've never had a token low enough on the stack like runes that's on the L1 or whatever, close to it. And it can go up to L2s and all the L2 builders are supporting runes like already. Stacks builders, rootstock, sovereign on rootstock, everyone's doing runes as well. So being able to go from an L2 into Rune and then use some DEX that supports Rune and then over to Rootstock, like this way of using tokens in that way hasn't existed. And I think it technically, well, not technically, it kind of makes all L2s connected to each other through like maybe two steps of trading that we haven't had before. Uh, I'm stupid bullish on that. If you're building something like that, hit me up. I want to invest in you. But in meme coin season, everyone's thinking about it as like degen stuff, but I think the utility of, of ruins in that way is going to be absolutely massive. I I can't even tell if I'm just being crazy or if I'm like correct, but I think that's going to be a thing. I think that makes a lot of sense. I've talked a lot about it that the future of meme coins is is on low friction layers. So what you know, whatever implementation technology, meme coin, or even different chain can provide that 
combination of low friction release and trading and settlement of these things and make it appealing to vgens i think that's you know that's a no-brainer I like that is definitely like the the thesis of this cycle, right? You see venture capital writing threads on why meme coins are an investable asset. First of all, what the hell venture? You guys are insane. <laughs> Second of all, like it's very obvious that this is going to continue for another year or so. Like it's just meme coin season. So now the question is where where is the casino going to be built? Yep. Okay. Uh there is there is the ever present concern of liquidity fragmentation. Um, this has not been solved uh, in in a world of mini L twos. In a world of runes thriving on mini L twos, you still have liquidity fragmentation across your L twos. Um, there's no easy solution here. You have fragmented rune liquidity across all of the L twos, across all of the different apps. There's no easy atomic swapping between them. There's no I mean, people are trying to do things like shared sequencing and other other kinds of things or um, shared bridging, but it's unsolved. And so I'm perhaps less than the, whatever you said, hyper, mega, crazy, stupid, bullish, um, just because bridging is pain. Uh, bridging is incredibly painful and liquidity fragmentation. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I think, I think the kicker here is typically bridges... Um, you take a name token and then you, you present a wraps token on the other side, and that's a one to one to one representation. I think atomic swaps are going to be the big thing here. Of like, you'll go from say you want to go from sovereign to Alex or so rootstock to stacks. You're and you're in the SOV token. You want to end up in the Alex token. You can go SOV into their go go power rangers whatever token on runes, atomic swap, and then use something on runes to go into something that's nicer to play with Alex and then Tomic Swap again, runes based Alex token into Alex. Like that's it's still fragmentation and it's still annoying. You're gonna pay two, at least two transactions, but to unlock what I haven't seen without having to go to centralized whatever's currently. Yeah, I mean you just said two Bitcoin transactions. So now it's like that's an hour. That's like an hour to bridge between the two ecosystems. Like pain. Max pain. <laughs> Um, at least. So, yeah, sure, sure, you can do it, but do we want to do it? Is that really, is that really the end all be all for DeFi on Bitcoin? Is we're going to go from one fast layer and then pause while we settle a whole bunch of layer one transactions to trustlessly swap to another another layer? Like, sure, like we can do it, but I don't know. I'm hoping for something better. That's why I'm like, yeah, it's interesting, but I'm not uh, he, hi, hyper mega. Super, yeah. Isn't isn't Arbitrum like 14 days or something? Aren't there like even worse options on a faster, more commonly accepted and used chain called Ethereum? Like, aren't some of those even slower? Let's talk about how some Bitcoin L2s are optimistic. And so, with optimistic rollups, generally you have a seven day withdrawal window anyway. And so now you're going from an optimistic rollup that's trying to settle in some fashion and then you're bridging. And now you have multiple transactions in, in in line. Like, I don't know. I think it's going to be terrible, terrible, terrible UX. We're 15 years into this and we just like still have such a terrible user experience. What are we doing? 15 years is no time. That is historically no time. Facebook 15 years down the road had kind of developed what it looks like um a lot of like technology in 15 years especially these days that's two or three cycle major cycle in generations um and here we are we still have the scaling and user experience challenge how do we get this to a billion to, to seven billion people like i have no idea the blockchain trilemma it rears its ugly head again where you can have decentralization and you can have security but you're not going to get scalability Custodial's the way. That's that's the answer. Just just trust Coinbase, bro. It's fine. I mean, yes, yeah, sacrifice brings us socialization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, which is a natural segue to, uh, you know, being co opted by the government and risks of 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 custody. Um, 
Yeah, we got to talk about Sandra Wallet, which I've actually never used. It's a, it's a privacy mixing service. You send in your Bitcoin. It does some fancy stuff so it can't be tracked and then sends it back to you. Um, so it's a privacy-focused tool mainly. And yeah, my understanding is the Department of Justice took down the domain and arrested the two co-founders. And that's all we currently know. We don't know how much data is in the database, how much is exposed, all of that. Is that the current bleeding edge? Yeah. I recommended Samurai Wallet to friends for years. Um, I've used it a lot. I even, even interviewed one of the Samurai guys during the ocean. Um, you know, shindig back in December. I know so I've talked to many of the Samurai team, a number of the Samurai team in person. Um, they are very, very aggressive publicly. So they're, they're, they just really, really shitty to a lot of people in Bitcoin, but they're uncompromising privacy advocates. And this is one of those things where you can, you know, if you care about privacy and open networks and government overreach, this is a, this is a, an, an iconic event where we rally around this and we say Bitcoin needs more privacy advocates. The, this, the particular government agencies in this capacity um, have done something really, really alarming that I want to speak out against. So um, shout out the all the privacy advocates in Bitcoin and other blockchains. This is a really unifying moment. I feel like a lot like very similar to the tornado cash uh, moment on ETH. Like that's one where it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what blockchain you're on. This is a, this is more of a line in the sand for privacy overall. Um, there is a, there is a worry though, because the mixing service required, um, you giving your XPUB over. So you have your XPUB from which you drive all your public addresses. So they, they could tell we're on the opposite side of the mix. Your coins go. The next pub had to be used if you were not going to use their own dojo product. You had to hand, you basically had to reveal your ex pub. So, in this case, depending on how the government seized or surveilled or what Samurai did with those ex pubs, you know, the seizing authorities can tell and connect public addresses after the fact if they have a sufficient amount of ex pubs. That is a that was a point of criticism prior to this to Samurai, but it's also I think really more of a criticism of the fact that Bitcoin is very hard to be private on. A lot of people say that's great, you know we don't want criminals, but I I say privacy should be something you optionally reveal, um, and uh, Bitcoin should allow that. And right now it's really hard to even. Even if you are an uncompromising privacy advocate, it's really hard to do that on Bitcoin's base layer. So shout out Samurai and shout out other privacy advocates. Yeah, this one, and Donnie, you were taking notes. I know you got some shit coming up, but uh, I'm, uh, I don't want to lose it. You know, This one this one does scare me because if you look at like Tornado Cash, I was just taken down on the ETH side a couple years ago. And like universally, it was kind of the same response. And now we have it on Bitcoin. Um, it is interesting that some of the people are have been like fuck you samurai um, and I guess it gets because of the way they treated some bitcoiners amongst the community but it does make me think that maybe I don't think about privacy at all I just spend my spend my stuff and if I sell some bitcoin I'll just call the tax whatever but I wonder if they actually have a better grasp on bitcoin than we realize when it comes to like chain analysis tools and that's why they keep coming to these things. They say it's for like tracking money laundering or funding terrorism, but like maybe if those are decent wrench in privacy and they have a good grasp on it. That's like my, I have no data, but maybe. And that's why they're trying to take it down is because they're breaking the stuff they have in the back end, the government watching. Yeah, I think uh, the, 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 the one thing I would add is in, in the US, uh, OFAC, which is sanctions compliance, is fairly strict very, very strict. Um, as a U.S. citizen, you are not allowed to financially transact with sanctioned countries, uh, sanctioned individuals. And in the event that you've done anything like that, there are very strict consequences. And this is like, you know, U.S. law. And so when there are services that are potentially facilitating interactions like that, um, like I don't, I don't necessarily view it as an attack on privacy, although in, in some fashion it is. 
Um, but specifically in the U.S., because of the regulatory environment, you almost have to do privacy in like a ZK kind of way. Um, yeah, it's because your hand's on your arm. Um, like, uh, I think if you had a mixing service and you had a way to just reveal like maybe country where you're transacting from in a secure way, like I don't think anyone would have a problem with that, assuming that you can avoid sanctions compliance issues and, you know, obey the existing regulatory laws of the land. Um, but when you just do blanket mixing, now there are concerns um, from the federal federal uh, OFAC and other other sanctions compliance entities. And they, do, do you guys do you guys know was Samurai constructed to be non custodial? They never held the funds. They never my held the funds. My, yeah, that's my understanding. And like talk, talking to some founders who you know, especially on Lightning, like with LSPs and all these kind of things, there's this like money transmitter regulatory aspect where it's like you want to go custodial, but it's a pain. It's a pain in the ass on the regulatory side for the benefit of if you lean into that mess, you could be like Strike or Cash App, for example. So the the working thesis of it, as I've been talking to founders is lead into the difficulty and build non custodial, but that's even now becoming less clear. That even that's not enough of a a shelter or a firewall to protect you if the people on the other side and you're just in the middle are doing shit that the government says is not okay. Um, so as an investor, like this is again terrible for the investment landscape because it's hard to know what the government's going to do on either side now custodial and like let me come talk to uncle gary or i never touched funds but you're still not okay like it's just a mess that's kind of what i was writing down um previously when the doj goes after companies it has been often their excuses that the companies had custody of funds right this time they're not doing that they were leaning in specifically to that samurai was charging a fee for a service and they were also leaning into the fact that they were not requiring KYC and had no clear terms, which leads me to the next question of whether or not Sparrow can be looked at as somehow facilitating a service. They don't collect fees. They don't KYC. No clear terms. They don't have custody. I don't know who could be taken down for that or if it even is possible to do that, but it is probably on the government thinks it's scary list. Um so it's safe on like the no custody, no fees thing. It's not really safe on the no KYC in terms thing. Stripe releasing that you can make crypto payments through Phantom and MetaMask makes me question whether or not Stripe or Phantom and MetaMask or all three are going to be on the chopping block for quite a similar problem, although in very different ways. Um, are Phantom and MetaMask going to have to enforce KYC to stay in business or are they all going to go to jail or what? Like is custodial... That, or, you know what I'm trying to say. Do they, the, don't they do? Yeah, some people say yes. I, I have no idea yet. Yeah, I mean, do nobody do. The yeah, do 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 they do countrywide blocking at MetaMask? Surely they must. I don't know because the U.S. can still use it, so I would assume that they don't. They offload that responsibility onto the DAP, and to the front end for the contracts. In my experience, I, um. I don't think MetaMask, I don't think the wallet providers do that for the time being. That's like the DAP's responsibility. But again, this is so unclear, especially with the FBI announcement this past week or yesterday. Um, yeah, I I personally am not terribly worried about self-custody solutions, but anything that isn't a very clear like wallet that does other things, that's a surface area for attack. Like what Bob said, the lighting service providers, like, to me, that's a very uh, targetable type of business as a money transmitter. Although I think it's totally misguided, but it's like, look at what Phoenix Wallet did the, um, this morning. Phoenix Wallet, my preferred lightning wallet, shut down services. They are one of the largest lightning service providers or LSPs. This is kind of the thing that the lightning ecosystem is, is moving towards anyway. Like 95% of all transactions on lightning or more are through LSPs. If this actually 
like proliferates across the other American accessible LSP landscape that like neuters Americans access to lightning. So that's not good. What about change now and fixed float things like that, that are not wallet providers in any way. They don't take funds or maybe they do. I actually don't know where anything goes when you send it to them and then they send it back. Um, are they on the chopping block too, do you think? Because they're technically mixers of a sort. No, that no. It's, it's unclear. I mean, like, yeah. I think that's, I mean, the fees thing makes sense. Like all these services that are building, they're, a lot of them are VC backed or try to build a, a sustainable business. And so you have to get fees somewhere. And if that's one piece where it's like, you have to start to police where the payments are going, not just taking it kind of vague in the middle. And that kind of puts you one check mark on the chopping block. There's a wide design space or a wide wide attack surface there. Like everyone's everyone's potentially attackable there. Uh, Is this just humans getting confused that we don't have geographic boundaries anymore? Can this all be boiled down to us just kind of not knowing what to do when there's like, where is the internet? Where is it? Is that it? The governments are like, you can't be nowhere. You got to be somewhere, you know? And then like 60 years from now, everyone's going to be like, no, nothing was ever anywhere, man. Like just live on the live on the internet. Network state, bro. <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> I seriously though, it's just it's a it's a monkey problem where we're all really confused that all of a sudden it's like things aren't happening in a space; they're happening nowhere or anywhere. I think this well, is all just part, a part of it. Is, part, well, yeah, I think it's probably in the death throes of fiat and it's trying to preserve its, its power. But then, yeah, too is like because you have these tools that are good at privacy. If if the government could track everything, then they would just they would be okay with it. They know that you sent money to him and that to that. And then it's so big ass social graph. But because there's been blind spots there, I'm sure that's part of why they're like, I I can't control it in the way that you can with cash, for example. Like credit cards are very policed and cash, anytime it's over a certain amount, the bank's gonna treat you like a villain. Like, what are you buying, bro? You're not buying a Tesla in cash. No, you're not doing that. No one does that. That's weird. You're gonna go buy drugs, sir. And it's like, it's my money. So like there's all these kind of like um, stopgap things they can do to control people that crypto when you can move a billion dollars for seven seven bucks or whatever it's just such a change in scale uh, I don't know they have to you know, it's kind of seems inevitable I guess the plus side though is the bigger enemies you make and it's, it's good start trading into this um, it's going to force regulatory clarity it's going to have to there's going to be huge court cases and they're going to also change how we and shit like all this stuff that's been just like old and and decrepit that's gonna have to change and it's gonna come through the supreme court eventually i can't wait i can't wait till coinbase versus the sec goes to the supreme court and they finally hopefully comment on this you know the sec is acting in a way that is unconstitutional for all of these reasons and we need regulatory clarity and here's what it is or here's how we're going to do it I mean, that's that's what people want. Uh, quickly going back to the MetaMask. MetaMask is like Sparrow, self-hosted wallet. Anyone in the world can use it. But Infura, the API that everyone uses to get all of your data, that Infura does have to comply with sanctions regulations. And so you do run into some issues if you're in a sanctioned country um, trying to use certain Ethereum-based products that interact with MetaMask. Like you're going to... I don't know, need to run your own node in order to get the data, in order to transact in some fashion. Or VPN. Um, so yeah, APIs, nodes, yeah, um, applications all have to worry about sanctions compliance. Makes sense. All right, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Do we want to do one more topic? Because it started late. I'm down. Because we could do we could do minor centralization, which is one that you, you've been talking about recently. Uh, Charlie, I know you're nerd about mining all day long, um, but everyone thinks about it from the lens of mining pools. And now there's like a different attack surface, so I'd, be, I'd, I'd love to explore that a little further, give, give people the alpha so they can stay on top. Let's talk about stratum too. Yeah, well, yeah, it's funny because a lot of what you know. Remember when roll the clock back? Remember we were talking about Ocean on this show last December. And we were talking about how it was really dumb that they, like, got, they got almost, like, pigeonholed into having to be anti-ordinals, which I think is a really dumb position to take. 
the original vision behind Ocean was actually to push back against perceived centralization in the mining ecosystem. And that was actually part of their launch message. That was like the dominant part of their launch message. And I think, and I I, I personally love that angle. I also love this idea they're going to try Stratum V2. Give miners more control of the block template, more private, you know, uh, template submission. But like, um, you know, it looks like they were directionally right and maybe just didn't execute on some of the narrative capture um, because we've seen several researchers shout out Parker Merritt of Coinmetrics and OXB10C, an independent um, Bitcoin researcher, as well as Modernaut with uh, Mempool.Space. Those three guys and possibly more had had various um, deep dives into minor payout flow, as well as in particular OXB10C did a great analysis on um, identical block templates that various pools were produ- were were working off of. In layperson speak, this basically su- strongly suggests that a certain number of pools are actually the exact same pool, just with um, different public monikers to the blocks they produce. And so this is really alarming from a Bitcoin standpoint whether or not you're a hash producer a competing block producer in the a bitcoin holder or a bitcoin user or even if you're a jpeg degen and you want to get your jpegs into bitcoin's blockchain all of these um are challenged by uh block production centralization this is not i would be very specific and say this is not minor centralization this is the people who produce the blocks that go onto the blockchain that is this does it mean that they just use the same block template or does it mean that they're actually the same mining pool in 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 a way oxb10c's uh strong inference was that it is the same mining pool perhaps even the same node so it's just they split up their hash rate publicly based on to conceal how big they actually are i would ask you how do we know that pool a and pool b are different pools how does a how does how do we just determine which blocks are attributable attributable to which pool the we the pools voluntarily sign their names in the coinbase output so it's a it's an elective self-reporting mechanism which is then communicated to the various different analysis tools out there to say this pool produce this pool has x percent of the hash rate um so so could a mining pool just say 20 percent of the time that we want to block be this identity 20 percent of the time be this identity and 20 percent of the time be this like that's possible that's possible and you wouldn't know because it's just an idea a specific private key essentially that's signing for a particular entity right for yeah, pretty much. It's because yeah. I mean, but isn't there an incentive here then? If if um if they are acting as like quasi brands, let's say they're just like shell companies, if you will, shell companies. Yeah, wouldn't it? Um, and you say it's like the ETFs, where it's like you have fifteen ETFs, but they all go into Coinbase. It's kind of similar, but not exactly the same. But if you want to push back against this like decentralization narrative and make it less of a topic isn't there an incentive to spin up more and not have via and ant and F- like the distribution be a little more viewed if it's that easy? yeah certainly that's the incentive yeah um this could be a very long deep dive conversation but those are the two high points yes that's- there is an incentive we would we would we would hope that people the ecosystem would recognize this and want to diverse. Could there be a reorg without us even seeing it? Because it looks like it's coming from four different miners. And thereby, could there have been a reorg? Yes. <laughs> on the having that we just didn't know about because it was four different mining companies, technically? Well, I mean, imagine this scenario. Um, we say, oh, look, Antpool and Binance are competing for this reorg, but they're the same pool. 
Um, but I mean, can they technically? I think there will be a lot of interesting back testing right. someone else could do. The other thing I wanted to point out is no, that Ocean Mining has a merch store, and I'm going to buy some pieces and wear them around to talk like I normally talk and try to confuse the shit out of it. Well, well, so Casey actually pointed out, so this was not as big of a news story at the time, but I will shout out my colleague, Will Foxley, who covered the launch of Demand Pool last September, which was actually... Um, the first major productized Stratum V2 pool before Ocean. It just was a very, I would describe it as an indie effort um, compared to Ocean's much more like well-backed, well-executed rollout. So Demand Pool is another Stratum V2 pool run by an acquaintance of mine, Alejandro, bit entrepreneur on Twitter. Casey shouted out um, Demand Pool. And uh, I think that would be a great mining pool to buy some merchandise from. Love it. This, this, this makes you want to get custom merch made that says, like, I mine with Ocean, and I choose the core template, like, on the back, so, like, depending which way you see, like, <laughs> that would be that would be so good. Uh, just to make it so nice is kind of nice, um, actually. The rest of this stuff is all, like, golf material that I would never wear, you know, like the golf polo, you know what I'm talking about? Like, business people wear. Yeah. But the crew neck Ocean sweater is pretty... Pretty good looking. I think I might order one. Um, okay, I guess to close it out, then real, real quick, like if if this is true and it seems like it is, um, like how do we know it's going in the right direction that it's being mitigated? Because it also seems now that once this is known, they could just change their kind of no infra and go back into hiding. Like it's they've been found out. Now we got to change two steps of our process and we're back to the same process. I mean, we, yeah. we would never know. Correct. Damn it, Charlie. Yeah, here's your big black pill for the day. You had a great week with Samurai, but there you go. Who? Well, I guess to leave people on with, like, we can, uh, if you want to go learn more about this, like, I've seen Matt Corallo be vocal about this. Who, who are the best people that are, like, vocalizing this that we should go look at if we want to be, like, at the edge? There are not a lot of people who I would say are offering solutions there's only recently some people who are talking about it. I myself talk about it. I do want to be very delicate and tactful about it, given that I do come from the mining ecosystem. Um, uh, obviously going to shill block space, but I'm going to point to Mononaut in particular at mimple.space, who watches blocks come in really closely. OXB10C, Whatever the rest of the handle is, that's one on Twitter you should watch. They're a Bitcoin researcher, very underfollowed. Um, I think there will be more people because this has still been a very, very insular kind of nuclear topic. I would hope that in two to three months, there's a lot better public discussion on this topic. Um, Matt Corallo, as legendary as he is, he has what I think is an insane and ridiculous idea to change the hashing algorithm. I think he's very misfiring here, and I think uh, he's really good at identifying some of the problem. I think he could be very misguided as to, like, how to respond to it. This is my opinion, but Matt Kral is, uh, you know, all, wants Bitcoin to succeed. Um, and um, I'm going to shout another fellow Bitcoin maxi, Marty Bent and uh, Matt O'Dell, like, OG, long time, very hardcore, literal laser eyed Bitcoin maximalists who are, I, I use the word uncom uncompromising a lot. They're very uncompromising in their opinions and uh, strong adherence to uh, like promoting Bitcoin's decentralization. So, T Tales from the Crypt is, is a good podcast to listen to whenever they do more uh, treatment on this subject. Love it. I think that's a great place to call it. Great episode as always, Jarvin. Thank you. It's gone though. We playing the long game to the black rock chains with the racks paid off from the blockchain. Going up high octane. So we up in here like Pyme. Making big noise. Big money. Go play with your kid toys. You funny. I'm counting my Bitcoin. We up and we been gone. It's gone. Playing it out and we did this purposefully. Panning out like the kitchen currently. It's like surgery. Way it's earning me. A nurse's salary for cryptocurrency. I'm on a vacay drinking coconuts while wearing polka dots. This ain't no hocus pocus. Listen up and learn. It's gone though.